Okay, hello everyone. I'm Leslie Diana Jones. I'm the Associate Director here at the Law Library. I'd like to welcome all of you to this wonderful book talk we're going to have today. And the book talk is for the talk, Say It Loud, on Race, Law, History, and Culture by Professor Randall Kennedy. If you do not already have a copy of the book, we have them for sale right out here. Be sure to get your copy. Or you can come to the library and check it out. We like to thank the Dean's Office for their generous support of these faculty book talks. And I especially want to thank Maya Bergamasco. Maya is our scholarly support librarian, and she puts together all of the book talks that are in this series. I also want to thank our, her helpers, our librarians, who are Caroline Walters, Christine Park, and Debbie Ginsburg. Thank you for their assistance. So before we get started, please take a moment to make sure that any of your noise making devices are turned off so they don't go off during the talk. Thank you. So today, you will be treated to a conversation between our author, Randall Kennedy, and his colleague, Professor Martha Menno. Randall Kennedy is the Michael R. Klein Professor of Law at Harvard here at the Law School, where he teaches courses on contracts, criminal law, and the regulation of race relations. Martha Minow is the 300th anniversary university professor, where she teaches courses on constitutional law, fairness, and privacy. Law and equality. Okay, so. I'm now going to turn it over to our speakers for what I know is going to be an engaging conversation, after which we will have time for Q&A. Enjoy. Thank you so much. This is a must read book. One of the things that astonishes me is that it was written during COVID. Uh, and I will just give you one quote to start. And the question I'm going to start with Professor Kennedy is what's your favorite part of this book? Uh, in an interview about this book, Professor Kennedy said, what do academics do? What do scholars do? They question. I'm in a law school. I ask questions. And by the way, with respect to criticism, I criticize everyone, including myself. When I write something, I do the best I can at any particular moment. But there are several places in this book where I say five, 10, or 15 years ago, I said this. But I've reconsidered, and I've changed my position for the following reasons. I adopt a skeptical, questioning, critical attitude toward everything. That is the best way to describe this book. It is filled with insights, argument, criticism, and self-criticism. What's your favorite part of this book? Thank you very much, Martha. And I'd like to thank all who've uh, made this setting available to us. Um, my favorite part of the book is um, the acknowledgment. Mm -hmm. Because when you get to the acknowledgment, the work is over. The book is, you know, it's, it, it's done. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice moment. It's a gratifying moment. But in all seriousness, um, the acknowledgments really mean a lot to me. And um, I, I, I want to say here, uh, in, in part because, you know, anybody who reads the newspapers knows that uh, our university is taking lots of lumps. There, 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 there's, a, there's a lot of condemnation, not just criticism, but condemnation of our university. And um, I've been here, this is my, I'm going on my 40th year here. And um, I write in the acknowledgments how grateful uh, I am for the people who help me do what I do. And frankly, I have to put at the top of the list, and I've said it before and I'll say it again, um, the library staff. Um, you were right. This book, I, I, I was not in the library during the entire the writing of this book. This book was written in the middle of the pandemic uh, in at my house, I was com I was completely afraid. I mean, I was terrified, and um, I was able to write the book 
because of the, um, the can-do attitude of the people who run the library here and who make the library go, particularly, particularly the reference librarians. So, you know, I, I, I list all their names. Yes. And I, am, I was grateful then. I'm grateful now. And I think that, you know, people who work in this uh, institution, you know, we should really be aware of just, you know, how privileged we are and how grateful we should be. So the acknowledgments were the part of the book that, frankly, were my favorite. Round of applause for the library. Mm -hmm. Woo! There are some uh, parts of this book that have hit the media that are, <clears throat> you know, very topical. But I want to take you into something that's not so topical, but is very fascinating. You wrote a chapter. There's 29 chapters uh, called "Anthony Burns and the Terrible Relevancy of the Fugitive Slave Act," and you said that you often talked about this when you addressed federal judges. Can you tell us all about that? Yeah. There. There. There used to be a program, I don't still, I don't know if it still exists, mm -hmm. but there used to be a program here in which in the, in the springtime, there would be federal judges from all around the country who would come here for two or three days. And there would be these, these lectures and classes. And the faculty here would interact with the judges. And I was asked to participate and I thought, uh, you know, so I've got this captive audience of federal judges. <laughs> I thought, well, you know, let's get a let's get a subject that would put a little bit of pressure on them. And so I chose as my subject the federal the Fugitive Slave Act of 1854. So here you have a, an act, uh, you know, passed by Congress signed into law by the President of the United States, upheld by the Supreme Court of the United States. And this is an act which empowers slave masters to recapture their enslaved property all over the United States. And so the question is, well, you know, what, what I would ask, I'd go in and I'd say to the, you know, to the assembled judges, let's do a little thought experiment. Let's imagine that we are in 1856. Let's imagine that we're here at Harvard Law School. And let's imagine that somebody comes in the door, bursts in the door, and says, there is a fugitive slave in Boston. And he is jailed. What are we going to do about it? We only have a certain amount of time before he's sent back to Virginia to slavery, what are we going to do? And I would say, okay, now, you know, and I'd say a little bit about the act. And then I would say, okay, now I'm going to subside for 10 minutes and in 10, you know, and, and talk amongst yourselves. And then let's reassemble and let's hear what you have to say. Now, I'd done this a bunch of times. I knew what people, you know, people, some people were going to say things like, um, you know, they would, they would challenge the constitutionality of the act. I'd say, well, it was challenged. You lost. <laughs> what next? And people would say various things. Some people would say, you know, well, let's pass the hat. Let's purchase the fugitive slave. And by the way, I, you know, I had a case in my head, the, the Anthony Burns case. Yes. This, was, yes. this was no figment of my imagination. This was a real case. It involved people here, including professors here. In fact, a member of this law school faculty was the United States magistrate who presided over the case of Anthony Burns and who actually sent Anthony Burns back to Virginia. And so we, we talk about this. And one thing that I thought was really striking was none of the judges, I did this a bunch of times, at least five times, there was not one judge who brought up the question or who, who, who urged nullification yeah. or who urged lying about it. You know, I'm oh, fine. I'm the United States magistrate. Let's tell the magistrate just 
tell the you know wrong person. Mm -hmm. You think you you know it's the right person, but wrong person. Mm -hmm. None of the judges were willing to do that, and I would push them. Well, you know, uh, here we have there's law, and then there's justice. Are you willing to cross that line? And none of them were. Any of it, that was. Well, that essay. very powerfully, you end the essay by saying this is not far from the present. And you describe a case from 2019 where a Massachusetts judge That's right. yeah. was indicted for violating federal law when she allegedly assisted uh, someone who was a non citizen from likely deportation by going out the back. Yeah. That's right. There was a local judge. She was I think the prosecution was ultimately dropped. That's right. But not before several years during yeah. which this prosecution was over her head. And she couldn't sit as a judge and she didn't have a salary and all of that. Yeah. You you brought us to Harvard Law School. I can't resist. You have a wonderful chapter on Charles Hamilton Houston. So Charles Hamilton Houston, you know, alum of the school, pioneer, architect of the, civil, of the uh, Brown versus Board of Education strategy. What was your goal in writing that chapter and what do you say? You know, um, so yeah, there, um, a number of chapters in the book are, are profiles of people um, and Charles Hamilton Houston is one. When, 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 we, when I came here, when we started, <laughs> Um, you didn't hear the name Charles Hamilton Houston much. You, 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 you hardly ever heard that name. That's true. And then, and here it gets back to the, it gets back to the, um, the faculty, uh, to, the, to, the, um, uh, to the library, the people who run the library. A couple of years, I've been here maybe, maybe three years. And the library ran a special exhibition about Charles Hamilton Houston. And it got a considerable amount of attention. And you, you might recall that it was after that exhibition and the publicity around it that the, uh, the corporation of the university uh, decided to name a chair after Charles Hamilton mm -hmm. Houston. And other people sort of caught on and, and Houston became, there was, there was a, a lot of attention paid to Houston. Now Houston was a guy, he, he went to Harvard Law School. Um, he came here after World War I. He was the first black person to be on the, uh, an editor of the Harvard Law Review. He was from Washington, D.C. He goes back to Washington, D.C., where he joins the faculty. He had a law practice. He practiced with his father. But he also became a member of the faculty of the Howard Law School and turned, and, and his idea was to make Howard Law School a hothouse for legal talent. And his idea was to create lawyers who would be able to challenge Jim Crow segregation. And he did. He did with uh, students like, well, his most famous student was Thurgood Marshall. But he also had, you know, Oliver Hill, mm -hmm. um, uh, um, he had a whole set of students who became leading lights in the, in the, in, of the civil rights bar. He himself was quite a distinguished uh, litigator um, and argued a number of very important cases at the Supreme Court. I guess one of his most well-known cases would have been Heard versus Hodge which is the companion case to Shelley versus Kramer. A number of you would have read those cases in your, in your property courses or your, or your con yes. law classes. Yes. Um, he, he, was, he, was, he was a great. And 
Now, one person that you and I both had the great pleasure of working for, an honor of working for, was Thurgood Marshall, the profile of Thurgood Marshall in the book. Mm -hmm. But as we know, Thurgood Marshall was very uh, tough with his um, celebration of lawyers. There were few lawyers that he celebrated. Yeah. He, was, he was very tough. But um, Charles Hamilton Houston, Marshall revered. And um, Houston, very tragically, you know, Houston died early. He died in 1950, four years shy mm -hmm. of Brown versus Board of Education. And Marshall talked about how he, he worked himself to death. And we just you know, great figure, and I had a lot of fun, and it was, it was inspiring to, to write about. Well, he, of course, was the architect of McGain's versus uh, Canada, um, which was a critical yep. building block for Brown v. Board. Something I learned from this essay was that Houston was himself a kind of tough personality. Um, so uh, now, one thing you do in this book is you, you don't shy away from controversy. So just, I'm going to read you a couple of the titles of the chapters, but I'm going to ask you about one of them in particular. Um, and uh, here's some titles, OK? One of the titles is Why Clarence Thomas Ought to be Ostracized. Another title is Should We Admire Nat Turner? That's the one I want you to talk about. Um, another is The Civil Rights Act Did Make a Difference with an exclamation mark. Uh, another is The Constitutional Roots of Birtherism. And another is Brown as senior citizen. You don't shy away from controversy. In fact, you once said to me, you should actually push. Don't be so moderate. Push to get the controversy. So I don't know if you always agree with everything that you say, because sometimes you reflect and you change your mind. But let's talk about Nat Turner. Yeah. Um, I was really worried about the Nat Turner essay, but it's gotten nobody said boo about it. <laughs> You might recall, um, again, during it was during early in the COVID crisis, there was a faculty discussion uh, on Zoom. On Zoom. And I talked about I the Nat Turner essay. And the reason why I talked about the Nat a lot of these essays were born, were stemmed from uh, classroom discussions or you know talks that I would give in class and one way you know so you know how do you know what to put in the book I, I would choose the the um, the items that generated the most discussion <laughs> and so when I, I used to teach a survey course on race relations law and one of the items I would give would be uh, Nat Turner's confession and student, you know, the class would read it. There may be somebody in the audience who doesn't know who Nat Turner was. Uh, I'm sorry. Nat Turner was uh, an enslaved person uh, who staged a rebellion in 1830 in Virginia. And it turned out to be one of the bloodiest rebellions. And it was also extremely consequential because in the aftermath of the Nat Turner Rebellion, two things happened. On the one hand, uh, the, uh, the slave power in the South became much more repressive. In the aftermath of the Nat Turner Rebellion, a number of slave states passed laws criminalizing the teaching of literacy to enslave persons, or frankly, or, or any black people, slave or free. So that was one consequence. Another consequence of, of it was that in the immediate aftermath of the Nat Turner Rebellion, you had another development, which was um, abolition immediatism. Mm -hmm. So William Lloyd Garrison begins his great paper, The Liberator, right in the aftermath of the Nat Turner Rebellion. So you have this rebellion and all these things around the rebellion. 
and it really does focus national attention on slavery in a way that it had not been the case you know, before then. Well, I mentioned a moment ago that Nat Turner's rebellion was very, um, very bloody. And so, you know, we're reading the, the confession in class, and there's, you know, there's not much discussion. I mean, after all, we're talking about a person who has been uh, enslaved. Uh, and so there's, you know, tremendous, you know, sympathy for the person who's been enslaved and all of the enslaved people. There's, you know, no sympathy for the people who had uh, enslaved Nat Turner and his family. And so people are sort of reading along and, you know, every, you know, it's sort of going along and, you know, nothing's happening. And that's, you know, giving me a problem because, <laughs> you know, I want something happening. <laughs> and so, you know, I asked, I said, well, uh, does anybody have any, you know, are, are there any questions about, are there any problems with, you've read Nat Turner's Rebellion, are, are, there, are there any problems? You know, no, no, you know, everybody's sort of chill. <laughs> and I say, well, on page 20 of the Confessions, there comes a point where Nat Turner's principal deputy comes up to him and says, we have a problem. Nat Turner says, what's the problem? The deputy says, we killed everybody in the last house, but we forgot the baby. I'm going to go back and kill the baby. Question. Problem. <laughs> now, actually, what happened in class is exactly what happened here 10 seconds ago. <laughs> it got real quiet, <laughs> real quiet. And, you know, I would sort of prompt, uh, well, you know, and people were really very reluctant to say anything. Yeah. Very reluctant. And ultimately, I mean, I would really have to push, and I would ultimately say, well, let me ask you the question. Is there anything, is there anything an enslaved person could do that would prompt you to say that they acted in an immoral way? And so we'd have, a, you know, we'd have an interesting conversation about that. And then, you know, if, if, by the way, and if the answer is yes, that there is something that an enslaved person can do that would make you think that they did something immoral, then the question would be, well, was there any agency in that jurisdiction that could adjudicate that? Because then, after all, the, all the courts were slave power courts. Was there any agency that could actually pronounce and go, you know, and so we, had, you know, then we would, it was still a very tense conversation. But it was the tenseness, it was actually the silence of the conversation that made me think, ah, this might be an interesting one. <laughs> and so that's what I wrote, and yep. that's what's in there. Well, and you do pick up William Styron as mm. someone who writes kind of admiringly of Nat Turner. And are you taking him on? Or are you disagreeing? Um, I thought that Nat Turner's, uh, that the, the Confessions of Nat Turner, the novel by William Styron, was, uh, you know, it was overpraised. Mm -hmm. I thought that he got a lot of uh, mileage out of being a white person who was willing to talk about, you know, the issue. And I think that people were sort of so, you know, sort of, uh, enamored by that, that they gave him a lot of attention that, frankly, you know, I read the, I read the novel. I, I didn't think it was all that hot, to tell you the truth. <laughs> and um, I thought that, you know, there was a lot of commentary. I thought, that the, I thought that much of the criticism of him, so for instance, the criticism of him, mm -hmm. black tin writers respond to William Styron. And you know these writers did not like William Styron's portrayal of Nat Turner because they portrayed him in a way which, you know, put him in a bad light in certain ways. 
And they didn't like that. And they didn't like the fact that you know, a white guy had written this novel about you know, this uh, you know, black rebel slave. Now, you know, and I talk about that. Talk about that. I, I'm, yeah. you know, totally against that. What are you talking about? I don't, you know, talk about what he did, not who he yeah. is. I don't, you know, I'm totally impatient with, um, you know, sort of racial barriers around in the in in the realm of culture. It seems to me, you know, people should be able to talk about anything, and the judgment should be, well, what did they produce? So I'm not. I'm, I'm critical of, mm -hmm. of of some of the critics, critics. of Styron, mm -hmm. but I'm also critical of the people who, you know, gave him all sorts of awards, which I didn't think he, he, his 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 product uh, deserved. One thing I love about this part of this conversation is you get a window into your teaching, and your teaching pursues debate. And criticism. Well, and we're, we're getting dangerous here because there's some people <laughs> who've been in my class who are here. I don't know. Uh, we're living in a time of cancel culture mm. where there is at least a claim that people are not free to talk in class. And you have taken positions on that, and I just wonder if you can reflect on that. Yeah, I, people talk about that all the time. I must say, now, you know, it could be that I'm. Um, it could be that I'm deluded. Um, I do not feel that to be a problem in my classes. Uh, you know, you, there's a wide ideological spectrum, and I hear from people, I hear all sorts of voices, and um, I, don't, I don't get the sense of people, of, of there being undue inhibition. Now I want to st I want to I want to I said undo inhibition. Because frankly, you know, um, some degree of inhibition is good. That's what makes us civilized people. So I don't think that just cuz some idea is in your mind, it should burble out of your mouth. <laughs> uh, you know, there's you know, sometimes you decide not to say something because you think that it would be sensible not to say something. Good for you. Maybe, you, you know, maybe it's a good thing to shut up sometimes. So, you know, it's, I don't think, you know, there's, there's good inhibition and there's bad inhibition. But in my classes, I feel like people are, um, you know, feel like they can say what they say. Now, I have had students in, in the past come down after class and say things like, you know, they'll make a comment. You know, they'll say, you know, you said such and such a thing. Here's my reaction to it. And in the past, I've said, wow, that was a really good, that's really interesting. I really wish you had said that in class. And there would be, you know, somebody would say something like, well, I didn't say it because I didn't think I could say it because I thought that, uh, you know, people would be mad at me. Now, Again, you know, there's a big, you know, I'm sure that other people disagree with me. Me, I got very, I would be very impatient with that. And my response would be, I don't think, I don't think you're in, you know, I don't think you have to fear being sent to the gulag here. And if somebody is, you know, somebody disagrees with you, or frankly, let's suppose that somebody is angry with you. So, <laughs> um, you know, what of it? And, you know, I don't think, I, I must say, I, I get a little bit, people say they want to talk. People say they want to have difficult conversations. But then they say that they want a frictionless conversation. They want to have a conversation in which nobody gets riled up in which voices don't rise, in which, you know, people are sort of all chill. Well, no, you, if you're going to have a conversation about something that people care about, voices are going to be raised. People are going to be, you know, sort of concerned about it. And, you know, there's, there, there may be some hard feelings, but it seems to me that comes with a conversation about things that matter, and you should be prepared to go with that. 
Well, I, th I do know that you model that in your classes, and I admire that. And that is why I'm going to give you the choice. You can talk about either the chapter that says why Clarence Thomas ought to be ostracized, or you can talk about Brown as senior citizen, where you take on some of the debates that Brown was overplayed and so forth. So your choice. But they're it's just examples of the book you have to read that take controversial positions. I'll take the first one. I'll take. Uh, why Clarence Thomas ought to be ostracized. In part, I, I'm going to take that one because this is a case in which I changed my mind. Mm -hmm. So years ago, I wrote a little book called Sellout, The Politics of Racial Betrayal. And I had a chapter in the book Sellout about Clarence Thomas. And I ended the chapter by saying, People ought not call Clarence Thomas a sellout. People ought not ostracize Clarence Thomas. It's full of criticism of Clarence Thomas, but you know, eh, wrong, eh, you shouldn't ostracize him. All right, well, I changed my mind. <laughs> um, I think that uh, I think that I was being actually too generous uh, to the uh, to the to, to the justice. Um, I think that the positions that he has taken, um, the way he has comported himself over the past 25 years, um, in my view, has been tremendously detrimental to the United States of America and to the, and to the people here. And I think it's been so detrimental that, um, you know, that yeah, I think he should be ostracized. Now, is that about his, his positions that he takes, his opinions, or about his conduct outside the court? I, I wrote this prior to, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even, I'm not going to even get, I'm not even talking about the last couple of years and the question of uh, gifts. I'm not talking about that. I'm really, I'm, I'm really not. That's, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the positions as he is, that he's taken. And again, I realize, by the way, I have very good friends whom I respect and admire who differ with me. Mm -hmm. You might differ with me on this. I, I think you probably, probably do. Probably do, yeah. <laughs> um, but for me, I think if I had to choose, I, if I had to choose a case, the case that really cut it with me, and that that really I, I had a different view of the justice was um, uh, Holder versus Shelby County. Oh yeah, the case in which five four vote, Supreme Court of the United States eviscerates. Voting Rights Act of 1965. Of course, whenever I think of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, there is a person, didn't write a profile of this person in this book. The next book will have a profile of this person. One of my favorite people in you know, all of history, the great John Lewis. You say the Voting Rights Act of 1965, mm -hmm. I immediately think of the young John Lewis in his Sunday suit backpack, waiting for the horses to run him over. And you can see it. You can go on YouTube right now, get your phone out. John Lewis, Bloody Sunday, Selma. He wasn't alone. Now, um, you know, I, I, I suppose that, you know, there's People have their very, you know, their, their views about things. But uh, at least, at least for me, and you know, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I've been wrong before. But it was, it was that and associated cases which made me view Justice Thomas I mean, you know, what the heck, you know, let's be totally frank about it. Not, in my view, for me, not merely an ideological adversary. 
but an enemy. Okay. And uh, that's, it was, it's from that position that I take the, you know, the stance that I took. It's a bracing chapter. I will say I start from the position that I disagree with him about everything. Mm -hmm. And so every time I find something that I think, oh, that's not so bad, that I'm just surprised. But anyway, um, yes. Uh, well, I'm going to press you then on uh, another topic that's a little controversial, which is memorialization, naming and unnaming. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you write about that? Yeah, the memorialization. Here, here's another one where I've, I must say I've I've changed, and I'm and I'm sure I have, I have really good friends who uh, who um, disagree with me about the memorialization. I'll say, by the way, that I have a deep interest in memorialization. And one of the reasons for my deep interest in memorialization has to do with a person who comes here to Harvard every year, for the last 10 years at least, um, a professor whose home university is the University of Texas. And that's my former teacher and good friend, Sanford Levinson. And he's very, he wrote a book about memorialization and you know, sort of the politics of memorialization. It's a big interest of his around the world. And it was partly through talking with Sandy mm -hmm. that I was you know, prompted to, to write this essay. And um, you know, I'm really glad. I think it's a really good thing that, um, uh, that dissenters, uh, particularly in the race area, it's not just in the race area, but particularly in the race area, have broken through the complacency that for so long shrouded, you know, monuments. So that, you know, people did, you know, people didn't make anything of a monument to Jefferson Davis or Robert E. Lee or Stonewall Jackson or, you know, or, or, um, uh, or Woodrow Wilson. You know, people didn't make anything of it. They were just there, and you know, people just sort of walk by. And Calhoun, uh, John C. Calhoun, my fellow South Carolinian, John C. Calhoun. That's right. People didn't make anything of it, and then people said, "Hey, hold it, John C. Calhoun. Why is there this huge monument to John C. Calhoun? What, what, what did he say?" Nobody knows, you know, when people are passing by John C. Calhoun and not, you know, paying attention. What was he about? Doesn't it concern us that John C. Calhoun was a person who believed that slavery was a positive good? I mean, shouldn't people at least know that? So in any event, I thought it was a really great thing that people pushed that mm -hmm. and released, you know, sort of broke through the complacency and, you know, sh shouted about it and demonstrated about it and, you know, and, and, and made an issue of it. I think that was altogether good thing. Now, you know. Uh, There's a but coming. There is a but coming. There is a but <laughs> coming. And the, and the but is, you know, I, I think of, uh, uh, I think of my, you know, my, my dear mother of blessed memory. Um, enough is enough. And too much of anything can be good for nothing. Uh, I think you know any good idea can be pressed too far. And you know my view is that uh, at least some of the camp that was you know pressing the attack on memorials in my view you know um again i think was really good to a large extent but you know i think sometimes went too far and i sort of talk about that i think that the chapter for instance focuses on the discussion at my college alma mater princeton and the fight over Woodrow Wilson. 
And, you know, um, I, 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 I was very, you know, I, I wanted to, again, I, I applauded the, the, the dissidents, and particularly the student dissidents, but I also wanted to sound a couple of cautionary notes. Mm -hmm. So one cautionary notes, I mean, there were some students at, you know, at, at, at Princeton who were leading the attack on the memorialization of Woodrow Wilson. And, you know, I listened to the students and, you know, some of them sounded as if they had discovered that Woodrow Wilson was a white supremacist. And, you know, I felt like, well, no, hold it, hold it, hold it, uh, you know, uh, I took classes with Woodrow Wilson's biographer, Arthur Link, you know, three decades ago. And, you know, we were, yeah, it was known that Woodrow Wilson was uh, racist. And, you, you know, you, you didn't discover that. And, you know, that, that you think you discovered it maybe suggests that you know, you don't know about history as much as you ought to know. Mm -hmm. And then there were other things. I mean, what, you know, what, what, okay, so, uh, you know, what do we, what do we, what does one do about Woodrow Wilson? It is true that Woodrow Wilson was, you know, Woodrow Wilson was an, it was a, was a bigot. Woodrow Wilson uh, stood in the way of Paul Robeson attending Princeton University. He was a thoroughgoing bigot, that's true. Woodrow Wilson was also the president of uh, Princeton who made Princeton into uh, a first-rate research university who hired the first Catholics and the first Jews to be on the faculty of Princeton University. Well, you know, what, 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 what do we do about that? Is that, you know, is that, is that part of the isn't, you know, is that part of the story? And so, you know, or, or one last one, there was an article, um, there was a columnist in the New York Times who wrote a column that said, yes, and George Washington too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And basically he said, you know, listen, you know, in these discussions about the memorials, the people who, you know, there will come a point in the debate at which somebody who is sort of on the other side of the reformers who says, well, gosh, yeah, but I mean, if we, if we, if we go your way, you're going to topple, you know, the Washington Memorial. And the columnist says, Hell yeah, let's topple the Washington Memorial. <laughs> and I must say, and I said, hey, again, this is me. I'm sure there are people who disagree. And in a moment, I'm going to subside. And the floor will be open to questions, comments, and objections. <laughs> but for me, you know, I said, I'm, I'm very well aware of George Washington and his complicity in, you know, enslaving people, his complicity in, and this doesn't get nearly the attention it should, the dispossession of Native Americans. People don't mention that, but, you know, he was thoroughly involved in that. His dentures. His dick. George Washington's <laughs> dentures were made from the teeth of enslaved people. So, you know, let's, 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 you know, get down to the nitty gritty. Mm -hmm. It's also the case that George Washington in, you know, sort of world history is an absolutely extraordinary figure. And there are a whole lot of countries around the world that wished that they had had a George Washington. George Washington, you know, here's a guy, you know, if, they, if he wanted to, could have been king. George Washington began, you know, the turning over of power in a democratic republic. 
That was no little thing. We still haven't figured out how to do it. Well, yeah, it's <laughs> that, 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 is, that is, unfortunately, is no laughing matter, yeah. looming. But again, you know, what does one say about George? I think it's a complicated thing what one says about George Washington. Any of that. Well, we are going to open it up. Uh, there are so many great chapters in this book. And just I just want to shout out, you, you talk about naming. You talk about the N-word. You talk about the politics of how we talk about history. It's a really good book. If Questions, give, uh, comments? One more hand to our speakers. Thank you both so much. Um, so as Professor Minot said, we are moving to our audience Q&A. So if you, uh, if you have a question for our speakers, uh, go ahead and raise your hand. My colleague uh, Christine and I are coming around with microphones. If you're joining us on Zoom today, please use the Q&A function and my colleague Debbie will uh, read your question aloud on your behalf. Who's gonna start us off? I can keep going. I have more questions. While you were thinking, I'm gonna ask about Brown as senior citizen. Yeah. Um, that was a, the chapter on called Brown a Senior Citizen was actually a, it began as a talk. And it began as a talk at one of my favorite venues, um, the New York Historical Society. It's one of my favorite places to give talks. And so I gave this talk and the sort of, it was, it was, it was right, it was, in the, it was in Brown versus Board of Education's 65th year. And the reason why it was in part so much on my mind and the, 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 the 65 was so much on my mind is Brown versus Board of Education was decided May 17th, 1954. I was born September 10th, 1954. <laughs> and I was born in Columbia, South Carolina and one of the four cases that constitutes mm -hmm. Brown versus Board of Education, Briggs versus Elliott, mm -hmm. comes from Clarendon County, South Carolina. And my, um, I have relatives, particularly my grandmother, who, was, who, who knew mm -hmm. people who were very, you know, instrumental in Briggs versus Elliot. And so when I wrote this piece, I, I, was, I was thinking, you know, so this, this, this case is, you know, in its way, the story of my life. I was hitting 65, and so I, I began it by saying, you know, 65 is an important date in, you know, the lifespan of Americans, you know, so, you know, social security kicks in, and, you know, various things happen at age 65. So I talked about Brown at 65. And the punchline of it was, I thought that people try to do too much with Brown. Mm -hmm. And here, Martha, I know you and I disagree. I know because we, we do. have been disagreeing <laughs> for a long time about this. My view is that um, people, for instance, on the left, have a line, you know, sort of the unfulfilled promise of Brown. The unfulfilled promise of Brown and, you know, it will get, you know, people will say things like, you know, there's more segregation in schools now than there was, you know, in, in the time of Brown. And, uh, and, and they try to make a lot, you know, you know, Brown was a great moment, but, but we backtracked from it and my view of it is, is that that's, uh, you know, people are making too much of Brown. Mm -hmm. That the Brown of 1954 was a, it was a tremendous step forward, but it was a limited step mm -hmm. forward. It was a vehicle that can only carry so much weight. And I think people are trying to put too much on it. They're trying to make Brown versus Board of Education the vehicle by which, you know, we'll get, you know, sort of, racial utopia in America. No, that's putting too much pressure on Brown. On the right, on the other hand, like our present Supreme Court majority, 
you know, they, you know, they say, you know, Brown versus the Board of Education stands for, you know, constitutional color blindness. Right. And no, it doesn't. You know, read it. Show me. <laughs> so I think that people are trying to do too much with Brown. I say, let's, let's, you know, let's take my view of Brown. And ultimately, I say, let's let Brown gracefully retire. <laughs> yeah. And we need to create new vehicles to take us to a new stage of racial decency. Brown, has, Brown did good work, but it should be allowed to retire. It looks like we have a Zoom question. And we have a couple questions here. Uh, may, may I recognize people? Oh, or, or, oh, oh, we have someone here because we also have Justice Breyer over here. Yeah. <laughs> to the Zoom question. Can you hear me? Am I on? Okay. Uh, there's two, but we'll start with this one. Returning to the idea of justice versus law, as explored with the Anthony Burns case, what do you see as the role of your students or other people immersed in the legal apparatuses in regards to pursuing justice when the law would seem to preclude it? Um, for, for, for me, I think it's really important for people to recognize that there is a difference between justice and law. Uh, law is a, you know, is a human-made thing with all of the you know possibilities, but all of the also vices that come with human-made things. And we should always be attentive to the limits and indeed the vices of law. You know, uh, um, there were the Nuremberg laws. Hitler had law. There was a law of apartheid. So always be aware that you know you might have to you might have to reach for something beyond positive law. At least that, that, that's, that's a, a, a position that I propound whenever I can. Justice Breyer. Two, uh, two things quickly. I can get myself into a mood like you just had on Brown. <laughs> I asked Vernon Jordan once, did Brown really make a difference? Mm -hmm. He said, are you kidding? He said, of course it did. Mm -hmm. It was at the least a catalyst. And more than that. OK. The other thing where I probably disagree with you, I sat for 28 years with Clarence Thomas <laughs> next to him. I never saw or heard him say anything dishonest. I never had a basis for criticizing him personally. And I don't think I ever agreed with him on anything. But nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, as a person, I'd say those 28 years count for something for me. And so does his biography, and so does the film about his biography. It's hard to put yourself in the shoes of another person. Uh, the two sayings, one, Clinton said this all the time. It's in the Bible. Hate the sin, but love the sinner. And those things, even on affirmative action, there's more to it than, you know, that I'm usually prepared to admit. And the other, I just read it, didn't know it. Lincoln, in 1848 or 46 or something, temperance society. He says, we're trying to persuade people. We're trying to persuade them. And you can never persuade anybody of anything unless you first convince him that you are his sincere friend. Sincere. Hate the sin, love the sinner. All right. That's just my experience. Yeah. There are others, too. I, I want to make it clear. I am not, I'm not making a personal attack on Justice Thomas. I, I, I can easily believe that he would be a fine next door neighbor. I can easily believe that he is an honest person. Um, so I was not making a personal attack on him. He is a person who is one ninth of the living constitution. He makes decisions on which hang the very lives of people. 
There are people, you've been there, there are people who are facing execution. And it turns on what a person does. So, you know, I'm not making a personal attack. I am saying that he is a person of power who has wielded his power in a way in which, in my view, has been profoundly destructive. And I want to, um, I want to say that as fully and as vividly as I can. Well, this is riveting. I don't want to distract. Um, but I did want to ask about a topic that we have not discussed um, that is one of our favorite ones to debate, but affirmative action. And I think you've written on it. And I know that in some developments recently, you're questioning your beliefs. So I want to hear you talk about that more fully. I have been on, on this. I have been in you know, my adult life, a defender of affirmative action. I remain a defender of affirmative action. I think that, um, I think that the way that the Supreme Court has dealt with affirmative action is bad. Not just its most recent opinion, basically, you know, getting rid of racial affirmative action as it has been practiced, but before then, I mean, I think the whole, the, you know, from the time the Supreme Court has dealt with affirmative action, I think it's been bad. So, you know, early on, the Supreme Court of the United States says that reparative justice is not a sufficient basis for affirmative action. It seems to me reparative justice was the best basis for affirmative action. I think there are a whole bunch of others that the Supreme Court you know, basically rejected. Um, I, the diversity rationale became the central rationale. I think there's something to it, but frankly, I think of the, of the variety of justifications as the weakest. Um, one justification that never even really made it onto the, you know, onto the screen was affirmative action as a type of prophylactic. Everybody knows, everybody knows that there is an invisible wind of racial discrimination that hits people of color. Now, you, know, you can't day after day after day lodge a lawsuit about it. But we know that there's this, this invisible wind. Well, it seems to me one justification for affirmative action might be it's a hedge. It's a way of meeting the invisible wind. Affirmative action, distributive justice, affirmative action, integration. I think there are a whole bunch of justifications for affirmative action. And I stand, so I stand with affirmative action. Now, and here I'm gonna, I'm gonna add something, and I think, you know, historically students here, some of them in any event, have gotten sore at me for saying this, but you know, I'll say it anyway. I'm for intelligent affirmative action. You can have stupid affirmative action, just like you can have a stupid tax policy. You can, any, any public policy can be handled in a dumb way. And I think you can have dumb affirmative action that accentuates some of the almost unavoidable drawbacks of affirmative action. And I'm against. Oh, I think, you know, early on in the history of affirmative action, there were examples at schools that you and I both attended where the school authorities, out of an effort, a well-intentioned effort, to draw in people from, you know, groups that had been historically marginalized, drew in people who were so ill-prepared that, you know, they flunked out. I mean, Yale Law School is what I'm thinking about. And, um, and, you know, and that, you know, again, well-intentioned, but it just, you know, it hadn't been thought out as well as it should have been thought out. Now, you know, again, well-intentioned, but it should have, 
so I'm for, I'm for you know, thinking things through. I'm also for being attentive to drawbacks. On balance, I'm for affirmative action. Does affirmative action have some almost unavoidable drawbacks? Yes, it does. And it seems to me that people should be, you know, candid and, and recognize that. Yeah. And the last question you said, this has been riveting.